Schizophrenia is commonly referred to as split mind. Their behavior, their responses, their uh, speech, their thinking is unrelated, often in a very bizarre way, to what's happening in the world around them. I mean, basically, you had a person who was medically insane out in the open, manipulating and maneuvering and um, uh, functioning in life. They were murders that were committed simply to assert themselves as gang leaders. There was no other reason for it. They know how to go up, cut someone, kick someone to pieces, cut them with a glass. That is what they know. <laughs> the Cray twins were far too violent, far more violent than was necessary, and they were clearly getting off on the violence. I was told quite clearly there was a price on my head. There was a, a bigger price on other people's heads, but uh, it worried me enough. I think they tried to model themselves on the Mafia. They saw themselves as, as Mafia-type gang leaders. They commanded a hell of a lot of respect. The name was very, very well known and very, very feared. I can assure you of that. Very feared. On March the 5th, 1969, identical twins, Reginald and Ronald Cray, were sentenced to life imprisonment. They were 35 years old. Summing up, Justice Melford Stevenson said, I'm not going to waste words on you. In my view, society has earned a rest from your activities, and I recommend that you be held for at least 30 years. Since their early 20s, the Crays had been building up a criminal empire in the East End of London. An empire of fraud, gambling, protection, and ultimately murder. Their arrest heralded the end of an era. Demolition and development is now replacing the warren of clubs and pubs that formed the backdrop to their activities. Yet the East End of London is as much attitude and tradition as it is architecture. And during their years of freedom, the twins etched a lasting chapter in the stories that are told there. A compelling fascination that is destined to outlive the twins and all who knew them. Inevitably, the Crays will always be remembered as Britain's only gangsters. A noisy, crowded, jostling concentration of street trade and street violence. London's East End has always been synonymous with crime. The squalid, overcrowded slums of the 1800s were a breeding ground for illegal enterprise as poorly paid men and women attempted to feed and clothe their families. Crime was an accepted part of everyday life and acts of extreme violence a regular occurrence. The wealthy, attracted to the East End by its illegal gambling and prostitution, regularly fell victim to the thieves and muggers in a dimly lit maze of narrow streets. By the turn of the century, London's East End was a teeming mix of colourful communities. At its heart were the docks. Here, thousands of men found work and ready criminal pickings from the vast colonial trade of Britain's empire. As the scale of dockland activity increased, so too did the illegal economy that it fed. The docks are a wonderful area. I mean, not only in terms of the sailors who are coming ashore, who are going to have their money taken off them by prostitution and who want to have a little gamble, but of course also the gear that's being moved by lorries that's being put onto the ships, taken off the ships, all that. And of course you've got nice access there in the east end of London to the markets as well. There are plenty of markets around. And you've got Smithfield, you've got Spitalfields, so that gear that is nicked and so on can be easily got rid of, can easily be fenced. There's not a great deal of evidence that it was organised. You don't begin to get names appearing as who, people who are controlling it. It seemed to be relatively disorganised. And I think what consolidated it all was probably the Second World War.
Despite intense bombing, London's docks remained the main artery through which precious goods and foodstuffs were distributed to a population suffering shortages and Spartan rationing. The black market trade in everyday commodities became enormous, and the tradition of petty theft took a sinister turn towards organized crime. On the shattered streets, a new generation were emerging to inherit the post-war underworld. During the daytime, we used to knock about and there was a lot of bomb sites. You can imagine what it's like around the East End them days. It's all they bombed was the docks to catch all the streets. So it was all debris. And we used to have little games, we used to have little fights with the bricks, throwing bricks at one another and all that, plates and things. Uh, it was like sort of running wild, you know. But the streets of the East End were increasingly coming under the control of two gang leaders, Billy Hill and Jack Spot. The financial stakes were high and violence almost legitimate. Jack Spot, Moisha Blue Boy, Sonny the Egg and Little Army Rosen, these were the governors at the time. And we all used to go down a club in Umberson Street, which is all a commercial road. And we used to play snooker downstairs. Jack Spot come down with Moisha and they wanted to play dice. They said, come on, chaps, all the table, we're playing dice. With that Benny, he was a big guy, he's hit Jack Spot, knocking him spark out. Of course, all his mob was in there, Moisha, Sonny, I mean, they all come down the stairs. And all I remember was that Sonny the Yank had an open razor. I'll see this, I was having a fight with Moisha the Blue Boy, I was having a stand up with him. And I see this open razor and he's done Benny, right down from a corner of his eye there, right away the down there. Of course, uh, we didn't know that was only about 15, 16, maybe 16 at the time. Never seen no razors. We had a stand-up fight, a little bit of boot, you know, a bit of leather in there. Had a nice fight, enjoyed it, that was it. Never knew nothing about razors. Aggression and violence provided the only effective policing of an increasingly organised gangland society. You're talking about there being buildings, sites, places set aside where it goes on. People know where to meet. There are regular fences. And you're beginning to talk now about a criminal gang. You're beginning to talk about a division of labour. You're beginning to say, OK, you do this, you do that, you do this. You begin to get the emergence of gangsters, if you like, the people who are responsible for seeing over gaming, for example, illegal gaming, that people pay their debts. Crime was now an industry, waiting for someone to take charge. Born in 1933 to Charlie and Violet Cray, the twins had grown up on the streets around their home in Valence Road. Weaned on boxing stories from their grandfather, Cannonball Lee, a renowned fighter in his day, they soon found a channel for their energies and aggressions. Boxing had long been associated with the East End, where it was seen as one of the few ways of escaping that environment. Their older brother, Charlie, had been a champion in the forces and was eager to help the twins on their way. Well, I came out of the Navy and um, I started to teach them to box. And in my mother's house, I arranged a small gym and a punch bag, etc. And I trained them at home for one year. And then um, after the year was over, I thought, well, now it's time to take them to a, a, a boxing club, which I did. And from that day on, uh, they kept winning and winning and winning. They never stopped. They boxed at school, you know, boxed for this school, London ABA's junior, and they could have gone a long way, but Ronnie, I don't think his art was in it, you know? He, uh, Reggie could have gone places in boxing, but Ronnie, he was a bit of a street fighter, wasn't he, you know? Identical twins, both successful boxers, soon became a talking point in the East End but their notoriety was beginning to spread outside the ring. In 1949, now 16 years old, Ronnie and Reggie were arrested and charged with grievous bodily harm after an incident outside a dance hall in Hackney. It was their first visit to the Old Bailey. They were acquitted through a lack of evidence. Already, people were unwilling to testify against them as the legitimate side of their life became clouded by a growing reputation on the streets. The boxing and the street violence and the gang fights 
go hand in hand. Of course the boxing is more organised, of course there are rules about it, but there aren't that many rules, and it's another way of settling disputes, of which in fact the punch up round the corner, or the good kicking round the corner, or the coshing round the corner, is another part. In July 1951, the twins turned professional, and after just six fights, they went through to the finals of a major competition. Reggie was proving to be a potent and skillful opponent, but Ronnie had become wild and overly aggressive in the ring. Nonetheless, they were both on the verge of notable success when conscription cut short their professional careers. They was only there, I think, one day. And they came home and I said, what's wrong? You've been allowed out. They said, no, I'm not having people like that screaming shout at me. I think, really, they just resented it from the beginning and they didn't give themselves time um, to accept it. And they came home and they threw their uniforms away and they never went back until they was caught, obviously. The twins spent eight months on the run from the army, lost to the police in the underworld of the East End. After their recapture, they were sent to a military prison at Shepton Mallet. I know your name. Cry. And I'll think to myself, these boys are a new kind. You've got it. You've got it. And I can see it. And you've got to learn how to use it. Now there's people out there, lots of people, who don't like to be hurt. Not them. Or their property. Now these people, who don't like to be hurt, pay people not to hurt them. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Of course you do. Then when you boys get out of here, you keep your eyes wide open. Watch out for the people who don't want to be hurt. Because you scare the shit out of me, boys. Wonderful. Rationing ended, a new wave of confidence and prosperity swept the country. It was a blossoming economy that greeted the twins on their dishonorable discharge from the army in 1953, and they were quick to seize upon it. They took over the Regal, a rundown billiard hall not far from their home, and quickly adapted to the local style of business. There was five Greek guys one day came and started demanding money and menaces from them. And, uh, Ronnie chased him all over Marlin with a sword, and that got about what, like wildfire, which it does uh, in the East End. And um, they never got arrested over it, but um, it stopped the problems. As the Cray's reputation for violence spread, they started to attract people to them. A gang was beginning to form. The rumour was floating about the East End that this, these two young tearaways out of Balance Road was, you know, going into pubs, picking on people, picking on little teams, because the East End and the West End was dotted about with all little teams. Each little area, like the Watney Street mob, you had the Commercial Street mob, you had the Limehouse mob, the Poplar mob, all little mobs, all very handy people. Gambling was still illegal, but the East End was riddled with spielers, tiny one-room clubs outside the law and ripe for protection. Through the mid-50s, the Cray's empire grew to encompass fraud and extortion. Their gang was now known as The Firm. One night, it was packed out, a brick come through the window. Of course, he said, I know it's trouble once a brick comes through your window. Uh, you know, it's problems, of course, they're all scattered, wallop, wallop, wallop. And a guy who was in the club at the time said, Bill, you want to go down and see the twins? Let's sort this out here. You're going to have problems. I said, oh, I will. And Ronnie come right out of it, he said, it'd be a pony a week. Which, them days, was a lot of money. 25 pounds, a lot of money. Well, Charlie was a joking bloke, very nice fella. In my opinion, never was a villain, and never would have been a villain. Reggie, you look at him in his eyes, you smell fear, and fear came on with Ronnie, you know? Oozed out of him. He had a, a smile, oh, let's take it two ways. Either he's smiling at you because you're going to get hurt, or he's smiling at you because he likes you. I mean, Ronnie would be laughing and joking about it. All of a sudden, 
it picked on you. Ronnie was becoming as aggressive as he'd been in the ring, even with members of the firm. I was at the club speaking to George and Alan Dixon, and Ronnie happened to walk in. And I never seen him. Hello, Bill. And he stopped dead, went in his pocket, pulled out a Beretta, went up to Dixon, and Dixon was about six foot three. Ronnie was about as tall as me, I suppose, what, about five nine, five ten. Put the gun to his head and bang, bang, pulled the trigger twice and nothing happened. I thought it was a joke. Ronnie took the two bullets out. He said, here's your birthday present, George. It was apparent that Ronnie was becoming unstable. For some time, he'd been open about his homosexuality, confident that no one dare question it. But his use of violence was becoming irrational. In 1956, he was convicted of grievous bodily harm. The twins had been separated. That's when he received his three years, and that was the origination of the real, real bad, bad problems. And that's the origination when Ronnie, I uh, feel, went strange. Ronnie was certified insane and transferred to Longgrove Mental Hospital. Some people may have the schizophrenia restricted to quite narrow areas of their life and behavior and they can be said to retain the ability to discern right and wrong um, uh, they choose or are impelled to behave in an illegal way because of the strength of their delusions or hallucinations and the and the schizophrenic disorder usually the schizophrenia is acting as a sort of uh, removal of control over what normally would be controlled in life. During the three years he was away, Reggie and Charlie opened the Double R Club, a legitimate venture into London's lucrative club land. In 1960, the twins, now reunited, became shareholders in Esmeralda's Barn, a thriving club in London's West End. They were to acquire an interest in several more. OK. Can I get a drink? Fantasy and reality began to blur for the twins. In 1962, part of a major feature film was shot in one of their clubs, and the Crays were immersed in a lifestyle totally at odds to their underworld activities. Everything seemed to have been arranged. Wherever you went with them, the doors were opened. Uh, people were waiting for them. And they were treated like celebrities already those days. It was a new phase in the Crays' career. Now they were mixing with celebrities and nobility and courting influence there. But beneath the glamour, little had changed. And I knew that they had control of the East End because that's how we got connected. Uh, that they came to us on the first day of shooting and said that it's very dangerous shooting in the streets of the East End, which was the case those days in 62. And, uh, you will get into a lot of trouble, you know, unless uh, you allow us to look after the film. I was paying protection money at the time. I assumed that a lot of other little clubs and drinking clubs, which was smothered all over the East and West End, I should imagine they were getting a few quids over there and a bit of fiddling here and there. Uh, nothing very big, but it was heading that way. The Cray's network of clubs, fraud and protection was now a substantial concern. Yet headquarters was still the family home in Valence Road. From here, Ronnie now organized military-style operations to protect and expand their empire. I've been in there in the morning, come about 10 o'clock in the morning, still in bed. You walk in the kitchen and on the table be knuckle dusters, flick knives and a beretta. So there was plenty of ammo there, plenty of gear there. 
And it was uh, given the name of Fort Valance, and Ronnie was called the Colonel, and that's how it all started in the early days. The days of the razor and the knuckle dust are all gone, and a straight fight and a good boot or a bottle. And uh, I know people disappeared. There was quite a lot of shooting going on. A lot of crimes were ascribed to them. People always said, oh, that's down to the, the Cray twins. Ronnie and Reggie did that. Whenever something happened, it was always Ronnie and Reggie. And yet, nobody was doing anything about it from the police investigation point of view to find out whether these were facts or whether they were just rumours. In 1964, Nipper Reed was promoted to detective inspector and posted to a police district in the East End. His first task was to break the increasing menace of the craze. As far as London was concerned, the craze were, I mean, talking now about the, the, the criminal underworld, the craze were acknowledged to have uh, control of the East End. South London was controlled by the Richardsons. Uh, then there were other areas that were controlled by other people of, of uh, less prominence, but the West End was always accepted as a kind of a, uh, a free-for-all, you know, in rather the same way that Las Vegas was with the American Mafia. I was never able, really, to assess the extent of, of their financial empire, but I do know that one club in the West End, a statement that I got, uh, said that they were getting £3,000 a week, another said they were getting £1,000 a week. So you can judge for yourself that, that uh, they weren't exactly paupers. Supplementing the protection racket, the firm was also funded by large-scale frauds, long firms as they were known. The twins relied on sharp-minded men like Leslie Payne to run the operation for them. Several bogus companies would be set up to order goods from a number of unsuspecting suppliers. And then you build it up until you've got about five firms or six firms you're getting stuff off of. And when it comes to the end, after about four or five months of accumulating a big uh, credit facilities with them, we always say, uh, you close the firm down and you vanished. Such operations provided steady income for the twins and fueled their fantasies of a mafia-style business empire. I can remember them hurtling around the, the East End in, in big American cars and, and they had all these kind of um, hirelings who would drive the car and if they'd stop outside a, a nightclub or, or outside a pub, the, some of the hirelings would sort of jump out and open the door for them to emerge. films of um, Chicago-style gangsters that influenced more than the actual stories, so that one had this funny fudge between whether they were modelling themselves on the actors who were playing the gangsters, or the actual gangsters themselves. In 1964, Ronnie Cray finally became headline news. His name was linked with Lord Boothby in a homosexual scandal that was set to rock the nation. This story was leaked by the police to Sunday Mirror crime reporters. By the next week, we were reporting that uh, the activities of the Cray brothers, but the Mirror didn't dare name them. We were much too frightened of the whole situation, even though there was already in our hands a photograph of Ronnie Cray with Lord Boothby. Fleet Street and the police wanted blood. The twins threatened to supply it. While we were sitting at the news desk, a man came up to us and said, you guys are going to lay off this story. Uh, I'm a printer from downstairs. I've seen this story. The word has come through from the East End. You are not to go any further, and you are not safe in this building if you write stories of this sort. And I might say we took that very seriously. There was no way that I was really wanted to get very heavily involved with them. Um, the Cray Gang. Once you have a kind of world in which violence is legitimated, then fear starts to regulate how people behave. And the Cray twins certainly were feared. In the late summer of 1964, two apologies were printed in the Mirror newspaper. One to Lord Boothby and one to Ronald Cray. 
The scandal had come to nothing, and the twins' reputation had benefited no end. Nipper Reed's continuing investigations began to flounder. No one would testify against the craze. Just as we were about to close the investigation down, a man called Hugh McCowan, who was in fact a baronet, went into a, a police station in Maribyrn and said that he wanted to uh, talk about the craze. Well, it was well known that I was conducting this investigation, and so this guy was sent over to me. Uh, he was a very well-educated man. He was running a club in the West End of London, and the story that he, he, that he told was that uh, the twins through a man called Teddy Smith were trying, was, were trying to exhort money from him, uh, a, a typical protection money uh, racket. Uh, he gave a long statement, and also his manager did too, and we found, in fact, that his manager was, was the person that uh, gave the more substantive evidence, and so based on that, we decided to make the arrests. We thought we were in for uh, the, the, the big showdown eventually, where we would be able to tell all there was to tell. But they were strong enough that they were able to influence witnesses. The case against them became very thin. In the middle of the trial, uh, I was actually in the hideaway club, the club where the blackmailing, the, the, the demanding of ministers was supposed to have taken place. And I found McCowan, the key prosecution witness, actually in the club with somebody who was retained at the time by the craze. So the, the, the whole thing wasn't being handled or wasn't under control at all. And the police really had a bit of a thin case. The manager, who of course was the man that gave the real meaty evidence, um, had already been tainted. His, his story to me was that, that uh, he had been walking around London and suddenly he'd had a revelation from God that uh, he shouldn't tell this story, that it was a story that was false, and that suddenly when he came to his senses, he realized that he was in Valence Road, and he walked into a 178, which was the home of the craze then, and there demanded to see a priest, and so one was brought to him, and then he confessed that the story that he'd given before was false, and that he now wanted to renege on that and give the true evidence. Again, the craze triumphed. Their position now seemed unassailable. They were all powerful in the East End, they were celebrities in the West End, and now they had beaten the press. Funded by a network of illegal earnings, supported by the villainy of the firm, and protected by the wall of fear and silence they left in their wake, the twins would never be more powerful than they were at this moment. After the McCowan trial, where I sat through a lot of the trial talking to members of the Cray family, uh, I got my first real meeting with them. Um, I, I dropped into the Grave Maurice one day, which was their drinking place at the time. And there they were, standing at the bar. They were playing the big-time movie gangsters, of just being the strong, silent men. But to anybody who's straight, coming from the, the big world, they really looked pretty stupid. To me, the impression was just that they had nothing to say, so they said nothing. But to the people there, it was strong, silent, powerful men. In publicity terms, they cashed in on everything. When the, uh, the Boothby scandal broke, the fact that their names got into the papers, apologies and all were great publicity for them. It showed that they were even stronger than Fleet Street. When they were acquitted in the McCowan case, again, for them, it was marvellous publicity, and they made the most of it. Well, in all clubs, you get an occasional drunk, you know, and sometimes they have to be slung out, and that's why there's doormen there, but um, I suppose it's nightclub land all over the world, really. It's just the same as... I don't suppose it can be that bad as people won't go to them, really, would they? Ronald, what do you think about Clubland in London? Well, I think most clubs are very respectable, you know, and uh, I don't think there's any trouble at all in them, except occasionally. Ronald, what are you going to do now? Well, I'd like to go abroad for a short while, and uh, then I'd like to be left alone. I intend to get married in the near future, 
Well, I did before this case, but it's put back over the case, and um, let's get married as soon as possible, you know. In 1965, Reggie married Frances Shea. He had courted her since she was a schoolgirl. It was described by the press as the East End's wedding of the year. Reggie and Frances' wedding was a, a very big affair. David Bailey, he was there doing the photography. There was uh, Diana Dawes. There were numerous people. It was packed. I think it's the first time I've been invited to a thought-to-be known gangster's wedding. It's quite an occasion. When the service started off, the, 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 the singing was a bit hesitant, and, uh, and a rather large man went down the aisle and saying, "Do I one to one row and then the other?" Reggie wants you to sing, <laughs> and things livened up a lot after that. Before Reggie and Francis could celebrate their first anniversary, Ronnie Cray was to execute George Cornell in the public bar of the Blind Beggar Pub. George was. Uh... Very cocksure of himself. He was. He knew he could use himself. He knew he could handle himself. He wasn't frightened of no man. He was calling Ronnie a big puff and all that. And of course, uh, the inevitable happened. Ronnie had a gun on him. Ronnie pulled his out, and I believe the words were said oh, well, by well. Cornell. Ah, oh, look who's here. With that, Ronnie went up to him, drew the gun out, pointed. He thought it was a joke. Pulled the trigger, but that was it. He, he just shot him dead. Perfectly gratuitous. Cornell had not been any threat to him. He insulted him about his homosexuality and stuff like that. But there was no economic threat uh, from Cornell or the gang that he he was a part of, which were the Richardsons. But when Ronnie Cray killed him, I mean, he said, "I've got my button," just as the Yanks say that they, when they've killed someone. Over 30 people witnessed the shooting. Not one would pick Ronnie Cray from the identity parade. It seemed this outlandish act of violence had only served to strengthen their position. We eventually traced most of the witnesses there, but uh, none of them would, would give evidence that they'd seen Ronnie Cray. They were immovable because there was always this wall of silence. First of all, this natural wall of silence that people in the East End don't talk to the coppers and the second thing was that this wall of fear the potency of the gangster doesn't just come from his capacity and willingness to to use violence it, it happens the world over that all these kind of illegal communities generate a no informing rule it's very difficult to as it would be a criminal with other criminals having to cooperate with other criminals if uh, it's also seen as um, perfectly reasonable to inform uh, when it suits you. So this, this rule is, is really at the heart of what we call the criminal enterprise. Nobody took their troubles to the police. You know, the police were part of the enemy, They're usually part of the thing that broke up the strikes and the docks and things like that. I mean, the police were regarded as being, you know, outside your society. And if you had something serious to settle, you tried to settle it between yourselves, and that sometimes did involve, uh, involve violence. Cornell's killing escalated a long-standing feud with the Richardsons a rival gang from south of the river. To support them in this campaign, the firm wanted Frank Mitchell, the mad axeman. In 1967, they arranged his escape from Dartmoor prison. A massive search ensued. He was hiding here, in a flat in the east end of London, looked after by Albert Donoghue, a trusted member of the firm. Soon afterwards, the Richardsons were imprisoned, before the showdown could take place. Mitchell was still a wanted man, but not by the Crays. If the twins got him out, and the twins are looking after him, nobody can kill him in, uh, in front of the twins. There's only one people who can hurt him, and that's the twins itself. Oh, the only thing I'll put it down to, he got too much trouble. He was a great big massive guy. I can assure you that he would chew and eat them two, plus aren't the firm for breakfast, and, Think nothing of it. He's a great big massive guy, strong as a lion. Maybe he got out of line, they couldn't handle it. <clears throat> they couldn't handle him. They didn't know what to do. And the only thing they knew how is get rid of him. Couldn't put him back in prison. They couldn't just because they would be letting themselves down in front of the firm by grassing him up. They can't say, come and get Mitchell, he's here. That's grassing. Them days it was never ever heard of. Nobody grassed in the underworld them days.
Frank Mitchell's body was never found. Officially, his murder remains unsolved. The story of the craze has several victims. None sadder than Frances. Amidst the glamour, she had become increasingly disillusioned with her life and found it impossible to escape the notoriety of her husband or compete with the intensity of his relationship with his twin brother. I think Ronnie mixed the pudding up there quite a bit. And very much the domineering factor of the two, uh, he might have got... Uh, and I don't know what, what he'd done to uh, Francis, but all I know is he was constantly rowing. In June 1967, Francis killed herself with an overdose of tablets. Reggie insisted that she be buried in her wedding dress. It really slaughtered him, and, um, well, for a week or two, he just didn't know what he was doing, right? he was wandering the days, and uh, when she died, he gave up, he had a death wish, I'm sure, uh, in many ways. Reggie's only escape was into the company of his brother, but by now, Ronnie's behaviour offered little sanctuary. He now saw murder as a demonstration of allegiance to the firm. Reggie had yet to prove his. McVitie was a uh, two-pound a week bandit. He was not, uh, he was not a villain of, of their calibre by any means. So he posed no threat to them. So any suggestion that he was killed in retaliation for threats that, uh, that he'd offered them is just nonsense. Uh, but the story that was circulated was that this was a, a crime that was really motiveless. The only motive that could be ascribed to it was that Ronald Cray had said, having killed Cornell, well, I've done my one, Reggie, now you do yours. Uh, he thought that he'd been invited with the rest of them to a, uh, a drink up to a party. You can imagine his surprise when Reggie Cray suddenly appeared and offered a gun to his head and pulled the trigger. Ron! Ronnie was always winding him up, I've done mine, you go and do yours, and he, he more or less wound him up that day got him really truly at it and he got him in the front. I don't think, I don't think uh, Reggie would have done it, but he, Ronnie wound him up. Put a man a man, no way. I mean, I knew Jack very, very well. Jack is a very, very good pal of mine. Whatever he'd done or whatever he was, he did more on that. You left us no choice, Jack! <laughs> he tried to get out of the window, but he was dragged back by the people there. And then he was held by Ronnie Cray, and by this time, Reggie had been given a kitchen knife, one of those long, serrated kitchen knives. He hit McVitie, first of all, on the jaw, and then he stabbed him a number of times, until eventually the poor man fell to the floor when he pushed the knife through his throat and twisted it and pulled it out again. Well, of course, it didn't take long for McVitie to die. Contrary to Ronnie's deranged beliefs, McVitie's killing did not prove to be an act of allegiance. Quite the opposite. The gratuitous nature of their actions had begun to alarm members of the firm. The wall of silence was beginning to crumble. You just got to go around killing your own people. You know, you've got Cornell, you've got Mitchell. Well, Cornell was one of our own, but he still... You don't, you don't go shooting the bloke because he called you a puff. Uh, half, the, half the world would be dead. You can't do that. And Mitchell, what are they have done to Mitchell? And they went and done that to Jack. Well, that, that, to me, that was the end. The police campaign gathered momentum, but Nipper Reed was insistent that the investigation gather substantive evidence against the twins before any attempt was made to charge them with murder. Yeah. First of all, started out, looking at, again, the frauds. And these really formed the basis of the investigation. And so we went on from there to investigate any other kind of crime, with the exception of murder. And this was a, a very positive decision that I made, because I felt that if we started to investigate murders, then the question of the, of the witness's safety might be jeopardised. The mood of the firm was very, very, uh, very dodgy. People were not turning up at the meets anymore. They didn't want to come to the meets. They made excuses why not to be there. And the nervousness on the two twins that was showing, you know, that they can virtually uh, 
in men they virtually pull out a gun and shoot you in the middle of the road or in, in the ass or whatever. It was almost common knowledge that Ronnie Cray had shot George Cornell in The Blind Beggars. Uh, as a matter of fact, when uh, later I started to investigate it, people in the East End said to me that the Crays did everything but take the front page of the Times to advertise the fact. I mean, this enhanced their position as gang leaders, you see. They must have felt such immense power. You see, when they'd done their first killing with Cornell, it must have been about a year or two years before they nicked them. So it must have given them a very high sense of power, the, the untouchables. No one was safe. No one. In 1965, the craze had seemed invulnerable to prosecution. Three years later, a trail of senseless killings destroyed that position. They were now so feared that even members of the firm thought it safer they be put away. Leslie Payne was a fraudster. He didn't need violence because he could charm people, he could persuade people. And so when he realised that there was no measure by which he could control the violence of the craze, he decided then that that was too much for him and he walked away. And so when I saw him, I was able to persuade him that, that uh, it would be important and beneficial to him, because I could offer him protection, to make a statement outlining all of the craze activities. And this he did. Uh, he didn't, unfortunately for me, know anything about the murders because by that time he'd long since left them. But he did tell me about the frauds, about the long firm frauds, and certain other activities that the craze had been involved in. He told me in no uncertain terms that the craze had threatened his life. And so as far as he was concerned, then it was in his own interest to see them put away and, and hopefully for a long time. On the 8th of May, 1968, Nipper Reed coordinated a massive police swoop to arrest the Crays and over 70 members of the firm. It was the start of an operation that would rewrite British legal history. It was all timed for six o'clock in the morning. They were all provided with arrest sheets and descriptions of the people that they had to arrest and so on. And of course, these were all over the place. They were all over the East End and, and all over other, other places in London, of course. And so off we went, and I went with uh, my then deputy, Frank Cater, um, um, and some other officers, and we went to uh, Braithwaite House, which was where the Crays were then living. And there we found Ronnie and Reggie in bed, and they were both arrested and taken back to West End Central Police Station. In fact, we were the first team back of all, all the teams that had been sent out that night. We probably got the easiest operation, I suppose. Now that the Crays were safely inside, work on the case could begin in earnest. There was still no evidence or testimony that would convict either twin of murder. What I wanted to do in this operation was not make the mistake that I did in the 1964-65 one. And that was that I thought once the Crays themselves had been arrested, people who'd been victims of their uh, activities would come into the station and say, I want to give evidence. They never did that. And so I learned then that there was this wall of silence in the East End that was almost insurmountable. Once they were all inside, it had been generated from uh, the cells of the Crays and others that now they were all together, they got to stick together. And that uh, if anybody uh, was found uh, to, to be uh, attempting to give evidence for the prosecution, then certain uh, repercussions would occur and their wives and family would be in danger. The twins could no longer intimidate. They had become too volatile and too violent. Albert Donoghue, who was one of the senior lieutenants, uh, one of the, the big hefty men, uh, his mother came to see me. He'd been arrested and charged. And his mother came to see me at Bow Street Court and said he wanted to see me in prison. And so I went along to see him. And then he told me the story. For the very first time, we, we got to know what had happened to Frank Mitchell. According to uh, Donoghue, he was taken out into a van on the pretext that he was going to another location in Kent. And once he was inside the van, uh, he was shot by two people that were sitting in the back of the van. And so that was the first murder charge that we preferred. The pieces were fitting into place. Nipper had the evidence against the twins for fraud and murder, but McVitie's killing would be more difficult to prove. One of the problems is, of course, that if you've got a conspiracy like that where a number of people are together when they commit an act, 
unless one of them is willing to give evidence of the prosecution, then you can't mount a successful uh, prosecution. And so this was the situation as far as they were concerned. We needed one of this group to come forward. We knew basically what had happened, that this had happened in the basement of this house in Evering Road, but it was a question of getting witnesses. There was one man missing, a man called Ronnie Hart. Uh, he was a relation, or it suggested that he was a relation of, of the craze, a cousin. Uh, and he'd never been arrested in the first sweep because we'd no evidence against him. We managed to trace him and uh, he, eventually he, he was persuaded to make a statement in which he said exactly what happened. And he was the prime witness against the, the craze. One piece was still missing, Cornell. A key witness to the murder had been a barmaid from the Blind Beggar pub. She was terrified of the Crays and steadfastly refused to testify against them. She had seen who had, ki had killed Cornell. She knew him, she actually knew Ronald Cray. And so uh, we began to give her as much comfort uh, and assistance as we could at that time. But we weren't getting anywhere because at that time people didn't believe that the Crays were going to be held in custody and successfully prosecuted. They believed, as they'd always believed, that they would walk on water again, that they would, that they would be able to be acquitted and come back to, to their usual uh, uh, habits in the, in the east end of London. Given a new identity, the barmaid was moved out of London to a secret address in Essex. Eventually, she was uh, persuaded by the, the, the nature of the support that she had that she could tell the truth. And in fact, later on in court, she very dramatically pointed to Ronnie Cray and said that is the man uh, that she'd seen in the Blind Beggar's public house. The trial started in January 1969. It was to become the longest and most expensive trial in British legal history, with more people in the dock accused of murder than there had ever been before. And then I went along to court, rather fresh to it, not having seen them for three or four years. And what was immediately clear was the changes that had come over them. Ronnie was fat and soft. Um, and was clearly not in control of himself. Reggie was more so. During the trial, we had these awful outbursts from Ronald Cray. If he had any chance of impressing the jury, they, that chance disappeared with those outbursts. The climax of the trial wasn't the dramatic appearance of uh, witnesses who people had thought would never stand up against the Crays. The climax came when Ronnie Cray was in the witness box himself and was being goaded very effectively by the prosecutor, Mr. Jones. He eventually fell apart and screamed at Mr. Jones, you great fat slob. Jones just sort of rocked back and let that sink into the jury. Here was the king of the underworld descending to name-calling. And if anybody was a great fat slob, it was Ronnie Cray. On the 5th of March, 1969, both Ronnie and Reggie Cray were found guilty of the charges brought against them. It wasn't a surprise at all expected. They said they would get 30 years. They told the barrister, they told the screws in prison in Brixton they would get 30 years, and they did. I was absolutely overwhelmed. I, I realised that uh, if somebody had said something to me, I couldn't answer because I was, I was full with emotion. Because this was now a, a situation that had been going on so long. You know, my, my whole reputation, my life depended on this almost. It was a, a fulfilment of uh, an enormous undertaking by my squad. And, and uh, you know, I felt uh, justified that they'd done all the work that, uh, that was necessary of them and that we'd achieved something, really achieved something. Aunt Violet, myself, and Mum was in the kitchen and we was listening to the wireless and when it came on that um, they'd got 30 years, you know, we was, we was dumbstruck, really. We couldn't believe it, like, 
And Aunt Violet looked at Mother and she said, oh, I think they've made a mistake. She said, I'm sure they have. She said, maybe they, they'll say later, like, it's not so long. I'm not going to waste words on you. In my view, society has earned a rest from your activities and I recommend that you be held for at least 30 years. It amazes me that a gang that was so badly organised, badly thought out, badly managed, could be so successful. The only way it worked was because their public relations was brilliant. I feel they were a part of the 60s, like the mini car and, and Twiggy and other things. You know, they, they were a part of it. Billy Hill and Jack Spot had a sort of notoriety, but they hardly promoted themselves. And the other notorious East End villains, Burke and Hare, went about their murdering fairly quietly. And Jack the Ripper may have left a note, but he was hardly exactly photographed with royals. They attracted people to them. You know, people who they should look up to finished up looking up to them, sort of thing. And Ronnie, he was his own man, you know? Nobody was gonna tell him what to do. He was the boss. He was much more a gangster for, for the, the thrill of being dominant and powerful rather than money. Um, and perhaps this was expedited by his mental condition that took pleasure um, in, in violence. And, and of course this was a, a factor in their ultimate downfall. The twins have now served over two thirds of their sentence. They were released for one day in 1982 to attend the funeral of their mother, Violet. Ronnie is now a psychiatric patient at Broadmoor and could stay there indefinitely. Reggie is still at Lewis Prison. The government have given no indication that he will be considered for parole. What's special about the Cray twins compared to any other gangsters is simply that they were twins. I don't think there'll ever be criminals like them again. They're like Romulus and Remus. It was only the existence of the other that made the one.